Welcome again to Grace Believers Bible Study. We want to thank you for tuning in today. I do want to explain what's taking place uh, with us here in Milton, Florida, the Grace Believers Bible Study. We're not having a first service at 10 a.m. right now because of this coronavirus outbreak. And what we're trying to do is comply with what the president's requested and what the governor's requested. And let's just continue with our social distancing because no matter what I believe and how I believe and what I believe about how this thing started, uh, it is a reality and it's affecting everybody's life. And so I just want to make that clear. We're not having services in-house. We're just doing one service on, on, on Sundays uh, at 11 o'clock. So people can maintain their social distancing. We've got kind of an older group, but I just read yesterday, I heard on the news where uh, the a population group between ages of 20 and 54 comprises about 40% of all the cases. And at first they didn't think it was very bad on that age population, just on the elderly and the older, and people were compromising positions, uh, health issues. But now they're finding that it's, it's, it's going to be tough on everybody, and specifically the younger people who are running around who's not going to die from it. The fact that it is, they might get, still get sick, but at the same time, they can give it to your their dad, their mom, their grandparents, and anybody else, or anybody that they're socializing with. So let's just comply for a little while. It's going to be over. It's not going to be the end of the world. And what I'm going to talk about today is going to be perilous times, and we are in those perilous times. Would you bow your head in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we come to you just with all prayer and supplication, thanking you so very much for blessing each and every one of us. Thank you for dying on Calvary's cross for everybody. Muslims, doesn't matter who, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, whatever you may be, Jesus Christ died for everyone. And now, Father, we know it's time to put all this aside and let's get this one thing over with and let's proceed. We know all of our blessings are in heavenly places. That's what Ephesians 1, 3 said. All of our best blessings are spiritual and in heavenly places. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. So that's what I want to talk to you about. I'd like for you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. I'm going to do a lot of reading today. But as I mentioned, these perilous times are just bad. But see, I want you to realize we're not in the book of Revelation. The Apostle Paul, according to Romans 11, 13, is your apostle. So you've got to understand that. And your doctrine for your salvation is only located in Romans 3, 5, 8. Don't let somebody tell you that it's not because it, it really is. And that's the only place you're going to find it in the whole entire Bible, the Holy Bible, the King James Bible. So I want to be uh, emphasize that very much. Uh, we've got people out here, and I'm sure you know someone who's believing that this we're in the, in the book of Revelation right now. And these plagues and these famines and so forth is taking place because of prophecy. Well, I'm going to tell you, we're not in the Old Testament prophecy. We're not even in the New Testament of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Hebrews through Revelation. We're in a, what they call a mystery period. And I say what they call, that's what God calls it. That's what Jesus Christ called it uh, in his Romans through Philemon. Now, I said the Apostle Paul was your apostle, but how do I know that? Well, we know from Acts chapter 9 that Paul was a chosen vessel by Jesus Christ himself before the foundation of the world. He saw Paul, who was a Judaizer, a blasphemer, a murderer, all of those things in 1 Timothy 1, 16. He saw that, that Paul, and he knew that Paul would accept what he was saying from heaven. So on the road to Damascus, the Lord struck him down. The Lord Jesus Christ struck him down, saved him right there on the spot. Didn't give him all the information, and Paul didn't go out right then and start teaching anything but the gospel of God. He didn't, he didn't start teaching until Acts 13 about what Jesus Christ did. He went on his first missionary journey in Acts 13 when he was separated, him and Barnabas, by the Holy Spirit for this mission, this calling that he had. But we know from Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, that Paul did not receive his information from any man or an angel or anyone else except from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I actually, just, just go over and take a look at that, would you? In Galatians, in Galatians chapter 1, I want you to see, I may cover it again somewhere in my notes, but right now, we are. 
In Galatians chapter 1, verses 11, Paul says this, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me, he's been preaching to, to these Galatians, is not after man. Well, either you believe it or you don't believe it. He said it's not after man. That's mankind. For I neither received it of man. Just eliminates the idea that he got it from Peter or anybody else. Neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, the revelation of Jesus Christ is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ gave to the Apostle Paul. He was named Saul at the time. And in Acts 9, he went out and he preached the gospel of God. What is the gospel of God? The gospel of God that Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and resurrected from the dead on the third day as he told those apostles. But that's not the salvation message. If you want to just believe that, you're going to hell. You can love the Lord all you want to and believe the gospel of God. Your determination, your eternal life is going to be in condemnation. But we know that he did that up until Acts 13. But now this gospel he was talking about, I'm going to cover it again too. I need to cover it up front here. It's in verses 8 and 9 of Galatians chapter 1. I do want to cover it. Paul says, but though we, him and his entourage, whoever is with him, are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let it be accursed. As we said before, so I say now again, if any man, any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Now at this point in time, we've discussed this a lot. There's pre-prison epistles and there's prison epistles. He's talking about his prison, I mean his pre-prison epistle. Okay? And you need to know what they are. If you're not, you're going to confuse what these, this gospel is called. But it's called the gospel of Christ. It's the good news to pick up the remnant of Romans 11.5. And he went to the Jew first and also to the Greek, the people in the synagogues. The thing is, that's not you. We were strangers from the covenants of promise, etc., etc. And aliens from the nation of Israel. We were the ungodly dogs. So, I want to say the gospel of Christ is what was preached. That is, Jesus Christ was crucified for our sins, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. He was buried, and he was resurrected from the dead on the third day, and according to Romans 4, 25, it, he was raised from the dead for your justification and my justification. But now we're talking about, we're going to cover the scriptures, we're talking about the gospel of the grace of God. What's the difference in the salvation message? Nothing, except the audience changed. And we're going to go over some of that. But first, I want you to turn over to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. And we're going to look at some scripture. Paul is talking to Timothy here, writing this to him once I find the book. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and I want to actually start in verse 1. It says, Paul, his name was changed to, from Saul to Paul, from a Hebrew name to a, a Gentile name. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Well, that tells you something right there. He is an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is unlike the other twelve because he has got a new purpose. The Lord does. It's called a heavenly purpose. By the commandment of God our Savior, who commanded Paul to be a a, an apostle, God did, and Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord Jesus Christ did, which is our hope. Who is our hope? The Lord Jesus Christ and God our Savior. Verse 2, he's talking unto Timothy. Go to verse 3. And Paul writes this, and he says, As I besought thee to abide, he, in, in, he, in other words, besought thee, even though I asked you, Timothy, to abide still in Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that Thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith so do. Now that's what the Lord told Paul, your apostle. You can't get around it. Teach no other doctrine. Well, what, what is that doctrine? We're going to take a look at some of this. Go to Romans chapter 2. In Romans chapter 2, we want to look at this doctrine that he's talking about. In Romans chapter 2, verse 16, Paul says this, 
in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the judge. God made it that way. According to my gospel. Now what's this my gospel again? This my gospel Paul writes about was given to him by revelation from heaven, the heavenly Savior, not the Messiah walking around on the face of the earth, to Israel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Hebrews through Revelation is not written to you. You've got to understand this or you're going to always be in confusion. There is no contradiction in the King James Bible. The only contradiction comes between your eyes and your head because you will not want to believe the truth. Just believe what the Bible says, as it says it, where it says it, to whom it says it. That's all you've got to do. And we're going to cover a lot of scriptures about it. But he says it's my gospel. That's Paul's gospel, the one that was given to the Lord from the Lord Jesus Christ to the Apostle Paul. Well, let's go to 2 Timothy 2.8. Now remember, this is a pre-prison epistle. And the salvation in my gospel, Christ crucified for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead for our justification. But it was to that select group, the Jew and the Greek, inside the synagogues, or those that blessed the seed of Abraham out of Genesis 12, 3. Now, I want to go over to 2 Timothy. We're going to look at this again. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. This is a prison epistle. After he became a prisoner for you Gentiles in Rome. But he says this in verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. My gospel here is the gospel of the grace of God. It did not change anything except the name and the audience changed to everybody in the entire world, no matter who, no matter what gender, what race, what color, no matter what, because we were all born sinners through that act of disobedience by Adam. Sin passed upon all men and death passed upon all. But the moment you trust this gospel, he calls my gospel, guess, ain't no guessing, but what happens next? You're saved, you're sealed until the day of redemption. Now I'm going to go back to another scripture. Let's go to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. We're talking about my gospel here. And I want to show you in Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Paul says this. In Romans 16, 25, this is his third mention of the gospel called my gospel. Paul says, now to him, that's God, that is of power to establish you according to what? My gospel. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Jesus Christ revealed the mystery to Paul, which was kept secret since the world began. What was that secret and why was it kept secret? I'm going to tell you what that secret was just shortly. Hang on to that scripture there. Now let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In verse 7. Paul says this to those Corinthians, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The wisdom of God was given to the Apostle Paul to inform all of us about that thing that was kept secret from before the foundation of the world. Even the hidden wisdom, oh, it was things hidden according to Ephesians 3, 9, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. And this is why, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, we're talking about Satan and his angels, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You know, this mystery of Romans 16, 25, it's, it's been revealed right here that Jesus Christ died for the sins, our sins, past sins, present sins, future sins. That was not known. That was what kept secret. As I said before, Peter believed that Christ was crucified, buried, and resurrected on the third day. But he didn't know why. He knew, according to prophecy, etc., uh, specifically Zechariah, that 
His sins would be forgiven one day. They're in remission, and we're going to cover that. They, they would be forgiven in one day after his second coming. So it's amazing. But you know what the scripture says? In Romans chapter 5, I believe it's verse 12, we now have our atonement. The moment that we trust the completed, finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are now sealed until the day of redemption. Even God can't unseal us. We are made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says. You either choose to believe the Bible or you don't. Nobody can twist your arm. Not even God would do that. But he loved you so much, he died for you. But the revealing of why Jesus Christ died was for this age of grace when the dispensation of the gospel of Christ and the gospel of the grace of God would be preached to all mankind. What an awesome program that the Lord and God and the Holy Spirit had in fact. It's just a wonderful thing. But do you see, if it had been known by Peter, Satan would have known, and they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That's just what it is. So I want to distinguish this gospel called my gospel, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of the grace of God, from the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, I want to go to the always that famous one that Peter preaches that is not for you, but was very appropriate at the time. It didn't end. It was just put on hold. Now, I want to go to verse 14, Acts 2.14. Peter's talking to some people. Who is he talking to? But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, He's talking about the Jews that crucified Jesus. You men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Verse 20. Verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We can call on the name of the Lord all day long now and not be saved. We've got not call on His name, but we've got to trust in what He did at Calvary for you. And for me, verse 22, you men, ye, ye is plural, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Go on down to verse 25, well, in verse 23, it says you crucified him and slain him. Verse 24, God had raised him up, having loosened the pains of death. But, let's come on down to where I want to be. In verse 37, he's talking to them Jews that said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Give us Barabbas. Set that man free. Take this innocent man, which they didn't think he was, and crucify him instead. Verse 36, therefore, of Acts chapter 2, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, the man hanging up on Calvary's cross, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They know they screwed up. In verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, Change your mind about who that man was that you crucified and be baptized. We're talking about in water. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You heard that? Remission of sins. We don't have remission of sins. We have forgiveness of sins. The moment you trust what Jesus Christ did for you on Calvary, you're forgiven of all your sins. Yes, Christ died on Calvary's cross for all sins, but it ain't charged to your account until you actually trust what he did for you. Now, I want to compare something. Go to Acts chapter 3. I want to go to Acts chapter 3. Peter's still talking. In verse 19, and you might as well go ahead and get Romans again. Romans 16.25. We're going to compare these two scriptures. And come on now. If somebody's listening to this that has never heard it 
or has heard it and didn't believe it, I want you to see this. You think there's a contradiction in the King James Bible when well, there's not. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Peter said, Repent ye, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. And it tells you when. What does it say? When your sins will be blotted. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Well, when's that? And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Now, Jesus Christ is sitting on the right-hand side of the Father in heaven, in the throne room. Verse 21, whom the heaven must receive, and he's up there, until the times of restitution of all things, which God, I want you to see this, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets. What does it say? Since the world began. But go over to Romans. Let's see what your apostle had to say about it. This is his earthly ministry. When he walked around on this earth for three to three and a half years. He's got two purposes. A heavenly purpose and an earthly purpose. You're not going to inherit anything over in the land of Canaan. Not one thing. But in Romans 16, 25. Let's just see because this goes contrary to what we just read. Now to him that is power, God, to establish you according to my gospel that he got directly from the Lord Jesus Christ and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. That was that Christ died for our sins. Which was what? Kept secret since the world began. Peter says, spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets. Now what to tell me, how can they be the same? They're not. You don't have to believe me, but I'm reading it directly out of the Bible. You've got to believe the Bible, you might as well throw it away. It's up to you. I know the will of the Father is that all men be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. You don't want to believe it? You don't want to believe me? I'm telling you, I'm reading it word by word here. It's up to you, and it's on you to make that determination. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm sorry. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Let's get over there. You know, Paul is your apostle. I read, I give you the scripture for it. But in verse 11 of 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul says this. According to the glorious gospel, of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. What gospel was committed to Paul? The glorious gospel. The gospel of Christ and the gospel of the grace of God. That was who? What was committed unto him by the Lord Jesus Christ? That's what it says. It's glorious. Whether it be the gospel of Christ or the gospel of the grace of God, same saving salvation. It's glorious. People don't want to believe anything. I'm going to show you what I just told you. Though. Go to Romans. Okay. I, just, I want you to put your eyeballs on it and let's read it. Romans 11. 13. Paul says, For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. Paul was taught by Gamaliel he was above all of his peers in Judaism. And he was a man of men. Everybody looked up to him because of his knowledge in the, in the scriptures. But you know now that he has been appointed an apostle by the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul knows he is the apostle in this age of grace, this dispensation of the grace of God. He's dispensing the gospel whereby we may be saved if we just trust that. But you see, he magnified, I, 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 he says, I, 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 just say, I am the apostle, I magnify mine office. He magnifies the office of an apostle. Not himself anymore. He has humbled himself. He has made himself low. There's a difference. He was always wanting to be his chest and to be the big one. But now, he wants Jesus Christ to be the one. You've got to humble yourself to be saved. Because you can't do it by yourself. It's impossible. 
If you think you can, work yourself there with all those good works before you trust the gospel of the grace of God. You're absolutely wrong. All those words are, words are as filthy rags. And when we get saved, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter, I don't know why, I can't remember, I had a brain lock. Ephesians chapter 1, I think it's, I don't want to think. In Ephesians chapter 2, my sorry, verse 10, Paul writes, For we are his workmanship. We, the people who have trusted the gospel of the grace of God, created in Jesus Christ unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Good works is what we're supposed to do after we've trusted Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. But you don't do good works to maintain your salvation. That's just ordinarily expected of you. What if you don't do good works? You're still saved. You don't have to do anything. But you want to. You're created unto good works. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, let's look at it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You're getting hot in this place. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul says, you got me? It's not what Peter says. It's what Paul says, your apostle. Verse 3. But if our gospel, that's the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ dying for our sins, be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And if you don't know this gospel, and if you've never trusted this gospel, you have no personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It says if, if our gospel be hid to you, then you're lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of, oh, what's it again? The glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. Jesus Christ, according to the book of John, verse 14, chapter 1. It's God manifest in the flesh. He was the Word. He created all things. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He is manifest in the flesh. We learn from things throughout the whole Bible. The whole Bible is written for our learning and our admonition. But it's not all written directly to you as Romans 3, 5, Lehman are. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're talking perilous times right now. We all need the Lord. We all need to be saved. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'll mention some of this, but I want you to put your eyes on it. In verse 1, I exhort, and in other words, that's encourage. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, that's your wants, that's your needs that you're asking the Lord for. Prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for how many men? The Bible says all men, whether you like them or not. All men, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks. Who's it to? Number 10, verse 2. For kings, and for all that are in authority. I'm talking about who's in authority. Your mayor's in authority. Your governor's in authority. Your congressman's in authority. Your local person that's in your neighborhood's in authority. The president of the United States is in authority. For kings and for all that are in authority. We're supposed to pray that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Paul tells Timothy this in verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. God is our Savior. Verse 4, I've already mentioned, but I'm going to read it. I want you to see it. 1 Timothy 2, 4. Who will have, God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? And that's what we're trying to do right here. Right now is to enlighten you on what the Bible says, not what somebody thinks it says. Now what I think it says, what, what the Bible says. 
Let's go to Ephesians 6. Pre-prison epistle. Ephesians chapter 6. I want to go to verse 18. Verse 18. Ephesians 6. Paul says, praying always. He's talking to saved people because the Lord does not hear an unsaved person's prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Oh, flesh is no good. It's trash. It's going back to the dust. But in the spirit and watching thereunto for all perseverance and supplication for all saints. All saints are the people and the body of Christ who are saved, who have trusted Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And for me, Paul says, and I'm telling you it's for me, that others may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. If you're saved today and you're listening to me, you've got a responsibility. People need to be praying for you. You need to be praying for each other that's saved. So that you can make known the mystery of the gospel. The mystery is what? That Christ died for our sins. Was buried and raised from the dead on the third day for our justification. That's how simple salvation is. Paul says, I plant Apollos water and God give it the increase. And that's all we do. We're not soul winners. We plant this message. Somebody else or you can come back and water it. But it's God that giveth the increase. The Holy Spirit puts a conviction on them of their need of a Savior. And then the Holy Spirit turns around after they trust Jesus Christ and says, You're a son of God. You're a child of God. You're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Wow. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I want to start in verse 1. We're talking perilous times now we're living in. This is not part of the great tribulation. Because when the tribulation starts, we're already out of here. The rapture takes place or the gathering of the Lord is going to pick us up, take us up into heaven, give us a new body. Our vile bodies be changed like into his glorious body and we're headed to the judgment seat of Christ. Then the tribulation will start. For seven years. Don't have me this about three years. Amillennialism. Post-millennialism. It's pre-millennialism. Pre-trib. It's going to take place. It's clear in the scripture. There's no vagueness here. Verse 1, 2 Timothy chapter 3. This know, Timothy. He didn't say Timothy, but that's where he wrote it in the book. And he's telling you the same thing. Also, that in the last day, you know we're in the last days before Christ comes back into the air to pick us up. Perilous times shall come. Yes. Perilous times. I tell you, hold on to that. Hold on right there. Because I'm coming right back. Let's go to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1. So, excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 4. That mean that. Verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, it speaketh expressly that in the latter times, we're there, last days, latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Doctrines of devils. Do you know all cults, they have a little truth, but all cults have a little bit of the gospel that was addressed to Israel to confuse you in this age of grace. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry. We've seen that. And commanding to abstain from meats, 
which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Listen, every creature of God is good and nothing to be refuted. If it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified, it's set apart by the word of God in prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance, this is talking to, to Timothy, which in turn is telling us the same thing. Of these things thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Nursed up in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. I'm telling you, back over. Back over. To 2 Timothy 3. Verse 2. For men, this is mankind, shall be lovers of their own selves. Look around and see if you don't see it. Covetous. Oh, that's everywhere. Busters. Proud. Blasphemers. Disobedient to parents. Look at the generation that's out here. The, the children are running the parents. They're disobedient to parents. Unthankful. Unholy. In other words, they're wicked. Mm. Go to Romans. Hold on here. Go to Romans 130. I'm going to read back up. I actually am going to back up more than what I wanted to. And just show you. I want to start verse 21 of Romans chapter 1. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. This is unsaved people. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. There's people out here that's worshiping those idols. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. It's all over the place. Homosexualism, lesbianism, whatever. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator. Who is blessed forever. Amen. For this call now. For this call God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use unto that which is against nature. Man and woman were created for each other. Women to women were not. That goes against nature. Men the same way. And likewise also the, the men leaving the natural use of a woman. Burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly. And receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. To do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, magnanimity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, the people out here hate God, despiteful, proud. Boasters, inventors of evil things, and disobedient to parents. You got it? Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Wow. I'm going to read verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, 
not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now, back over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 3. You're going to see some of the same things. Without natural affection. In other words, they're unsociable. Truth breakers. False accusers. Incontinence. In other words, they have no self-control. Fierce. Despisers of those that are good. Traitors. Heavy. In other words, reckless. High-minded. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. That's where we're at in these perilous times, these last days. But you're not in revelation. And you're not in the tribulation. The minor distress or afflictions that we're going through is going to get worse. But it's not the tribulation. We are what? We are not going to have any wrath. The wrath of Christ, the wrath of God, and nothing. We're going to be lifted out of here and we're going to the judgment seat of Christ when, when that rapture is set up to go. People are waiting for it. We just don't know when it's going to happen. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. I might have read this. I don't know. No, I don't think so. I'm going to start in verse 9. Paul says about all these things that we've just been talking about. He said in verse 9 of 1 Timothy 4, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation to everybody. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach. Yes, we do. Because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men. Especially those that believe. He's telling Timothy, and I'm telling you, we're under the same command. These things command and teach. Verse 11. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity, till I come, he told Timothy. Give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Wow. There's some, there's some things in this Bible that's taking place. This is not prophecy. We can actually see these things. It's not in prophecy. We're not in prophecy. In verse 16 of the same chapter we were in, 1 Timothy 4. Take heed unto thyself and unto thy doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. That was a summary of the verses. Continue teaching what Paul told, told Timothy. That's what we're supposed to do. Go over to Titus chapter 2. Let's see what Titus, what Paul wrote to Titus. Titus chapter 2. I want to start in verse 1. Paul says, uh, Titus, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. What are those things? Sound doctrine. That Christ was crucified for our sins. That he was buried and resurrected from the dead on the third day for our justification. That sound doctrine that Paul taught. And he got it from the risen Savior from heaven. There's a heavenly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and we're in it. There was an earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and we're not in it and nothing in it applies to us as far as salvation. We learn from the entire Bible again, I'm telling you, but it's not all written to you, but Romans through Philemon is. Let's go down to verse 11 of Titus 2. 
For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to how many men? All men at that present time. Teaching us something. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope. That's the rapture, people. And the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. But look, I want to read verse 12 again. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. How do you do that? Well, the only way to live righteously and godly in this present world that we're in is not in the flesh. It's in the spirit. <coughs> you can't live godly and righteously in this old flesh. Impossible. It's condemned. So in Romans chapter 6, 11, Paul says, Reckon thyself to be, reckon thyself dead unto sin. In other words, you've got to, I'm going to read it. I, I, I don't want to just paraphrase it. I want to read it. Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Likewise, reckon you also yourselves to be dead. He's talking to saved people indeed unto sin. Dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's awesome. 2 Timothy chapter 1, let's go. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul says this. What's well, wrong? <laughs> that was 1 Timothy. That ain't going to work. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Let me see where I want it. I want to read verse 11. Paul says to Timothy, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher. Who was he appointed by? The Lord Jesus Christ. And an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You know, I've committed my eternal life to the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did at Calvary. Have you? If you haven't, why not? Why not? Verse 13 is where I hit it. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Hold fast the form of sound words. Where's those sound words found in your Bible? In Romans 3, 5, Lehman. That's where they're found. In 2 Timothy chapter 4. I want to start somewhere in verse 3. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 3. I hope you understand that we are in perilous times. The rapture is close. We just don't know when. For the time will come, and that's right now, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heed to themselves, teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things Endure afflictions. When you're teaching and sharing the word of God rightly divided and you're teaching the gospel of the grace of God, you're going to suffer afflictions. I promise you. Do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of thy ministry. And then Paul says, for I am now ready to be offered. He knows his time is close and the time of my departure is hand. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. 
Have you fought a good fight? Have you kept the course? Have you finished your course? No, you're not. You haven't finished your course. You're still alive. You've kept the faith. But let's tell somebody else about it. How about that? That's our, that's our godly duty to tell somebody about it. The, uh, these people won't endure sound doctrine. And just turn on the TV, turn on the radio, and just get your King James Bible out and listen to it, some of it. You can't stand much of it, but you're going to see just how erroneous in what they're preaching. Oh, yes, they preach a little truth mixed in with a bunch of nothing. Occultish. I don't care what type of denomination it is. I don't care what type of denomination it is. There's only one denomination in the scriptures, and that's the religion of the Jews. All these are man-made. Let's go to Titus again. Titus. Verse 9, chapter 1. Paul tells Titus, Hold fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able to by sound doctrine, Romans 3, 5, Lehman, both to exhort as to encourage and to convince the naysayers, those who try to contradict what you're telling of the truth. Gainsayers, they're trying to contradict what you say. It's everywhere out here. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they are not. And there's a reason. What is it? The last three words? For filthy lucre's sake. Money. The love of money is the root of all evil. Nothing wrong with money. It's the love of money. It's everywhere. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Paul says this in verse 3. He says, If any man teach otherwise than what we've been talking about this morning out of the Scripture and consent not to hold some words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, that he is proud, knowing nothing, but doubting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth. And that's where most everybody in this world is out. They're destitute of the truth, especially in your seminaries that you send your children to. Supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. I just, I see it all the time. Verse 11. But thou, o man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, and patience, meekness, Verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I want to read that again. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you have laid hold on eternal life. You have laid hold on eternal life. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 7. Paul says, well, I think I want to start somewhere else. Start verse 1. 2 Timothy 2.1. 
Now therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me, talking about Paul, among many witnesses, the same, what is he talking about? The things you've heard of me, commit thou to faithful men. That's what we do at Grace Believers Bible Study. We've got three men or four men in here that teach. They're faithful men. They understand the Scriptures. They want you to understand the Scriptures. That's their calling. Who shall be able to teach others also. Just because you're not being able to teach doesn't mean you can't witness and share the gospel of the grace of God. Some men are not called to be preachers, pastors. But you're called to be ambassadors. We all are. And saints of God. That therefore end your hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You're a soldier of Christ. Verse 4. No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life. That he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 7. Consider what I say, Paul tells Timothy. And the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Consider what I say. Boy, that's a statement. That's what I want you to do today. It came from the risen Savior to Paul, to Timothy, and it come from Timothy and Paul both out of this scripture to me. And it comes to you. What are we supposed to do? We tell people, consider what I say. Check me out. Be a Berean. See if what I'm telling you is the truth. I have no problem with that. And the Lord give thee understanding in all things. In 2 Timothy 2.15, the Bible says, study to show thyself a proud unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Most people don't even know what the word of truth is. They think it's the Bible itself. No, it's not. Because Ephesians 1.3 tells you that the word of truth come is the gospel of your salvation. Come, and you find it in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. That's what the word of truth, you divide the gospel, Paul's gospel, out from all the other gospels, which we're talking basically the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, which is different than what Peter preached. Divide them out. Don't conflict them together. Don't put them together. That's the gospel of your salvation. The only way to be saved. 2 Timothy chapter 3. That, verse 10. Paul's still telling Timothy, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, which is patience, charity, and then he lists patience. Persecutions that I've been through, afflictions, which came into me in Antioch, at Iconium, and Leicester. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me, and He will deliver you. Yea, listen to this. And all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It didn't say a tribulation. It's afflictions, it's persecution. If you're a child of God and you tell somebody, which you should, that's your reasonable experience or, or your reasonable service. Present your body as a living sacrifice, Dave. Go to verse 16. I've said this over and over. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Every bit of this whole body. For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, are you a man of God? I'm talking to the ladies, we're all men of God. You're created a new creature in Christ. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Second Timothy chapter 4.
Well, I'm not going to go there. I just want you to see that last verse. 2 Timothy 3, 12. Yay! And all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you haven't trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then why not? Just why not? The Lord wants all men to be saved. And how can that happen? It's by you trusting what Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross for you. What did he do again? He took the sins of the world. He died for our sins. You're a sinner. And you will be a sinner until the day you die. In the flesh. But once you, excuse me, once you trust the gospel of the grace of God, you are as righteous as God Almighty. Because it's God's righteousness that's placed upon your account. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. God's righteousness was placed on my account. Yes, when you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Trust that Christ died for our sins, your sins, was buried and resurrected from the dead on the third day for your justification. And you will be saved and you will be saved eternally. Don't let nobody talk you into water baptism. That's a word. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, it tells you, for by one spirit, are we all baptized into one body? And that's the body of Christ, the spiritual invisible church. And Jesus Christ, according to Colossians 1.18, is the head of that church. And he created everything. Trust Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And that's the message I have for you today.